John Ziegler is uh, on the phone. He is a senior columnist at Mediate. He is a controversial guy, both left and right, because he calls them as he sees them. Uh, I think he's one of the braver guys. I think he's also a little suicidal uh, in his approach, but <laughs> but he is also one of the only people I know that when he says, this is what I believe, I know that's exactly what he believes. And that is very rare and worth a lot today. Hello, John. How are you? Wow, Glenn. You know, I think the main reason I come on your show is just to hear your different intros to me. <laughs> <laughs> That, well, that one was really good. That, thank you. My wife would agree with just about everything you just said. Yeah, especially the suicidal in your right, career. Exactly. Yeah, that was yeah, the yeah. part that I, I was thinking yeah. about. Yeah, okay. Um, so, John, you wrote a great ar- article after 10 years of investigating the Penn State scandal. Here's what the uh, case taught me about modern media. Uh, and I can't believe media uh, or media, uh, Mediate actually let you print this. Um, but uh, they did. So well, that's a story. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Um, they have. Uh, you, you, we're not going to relitigate the uh, Sandusky uh, thing. You right. say I. You know, I did a podcast with hours and hours and hours with the benefit of hindsight. Uh, hindsight. Um, but uh, you you want to use that to show us, for instance, let's let's compare it now and and show us COVID. Right. No, you've hit on exactly why I think this story is relevant, although I will say, uh, you know, here we are on the 10th anniversary of the Penn State scandal. And for those that don't remember, this is the Jerry Sandusky sex abuse scandal that resulted in the firing of the great Joe Paterno and three Penn State administrators going to jail and Sandusky's going to almost certainly die in prison. I mean, that story in and of itself was a huge story. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we have rewritten history and told you what really did happen in our epic podcast with the benefit of hindsight is, I think, inherently relevant. Relevant in any rational world would be relitigated by the news media. But being realistic, I think, I it, decided- and John, I want you to know, um, you know, people, uh, people like you who speak the truth that is unpopular, they are always recognized much later, usually when they're dead. Um, but <laughs> I, I think your, I think your podcast and all of your reporting on this, I think it will turn that story around eventually. I would like to believe that. It probably will be after I'm dead. I'm preparing my nine-year-old daughter to, to, to eventually yeah. take the reins on that. Yeah. But, look, I pre- Glenn, I appreciate that more than you know. And let me do last thing on my podcast. I mean, people who have no interest in this story find it to be the most amazing podcast that they've ever encountered. I mean, it's, it's gripping. It's entertaining. I have a female co-host who was a television sportscaster here in Los Angeles who's now a, a, a professor uh, of media at Syracuse University named Liv Sabib. It's an amazing ride. And we have proven this case beyond any comprehension uh, and any shadow of the doubt. And you will learn so much about humanity and the news media. And I believe you will learn how we got into this COVID mess, because a lot of what I wrote in this media column relates directly to COVID. And, And the main parts of that are what happens when everyone gets locked in emotionally and professionally into a narrative in no time where we don't know the true facts and where everyone is in a panic, a moral panic in this case involving child sex abuse, we all lose our minds, and then the experts see an opportunity to, to forward their agenda. And once the story is written, and it can happen in only a couple of days, and that's what happened in Penn State, a couple of days, 10 years ago, we were told a nonsensical story about Jerry Sandusky having raped a boy in a shower and uh, a coach telling Joe Paterno and he basically doing nothing at Penn State covering up for this former assistant coach. That story is absurd. Now, sometimes absurd stories happen, but they come with evidence. This one did not. In fact, if you listen to the podcast, you know we've proven what actually did happen, and it's not that. But once everyone's invested, there's no going back. And I guess one of the more amazing elements of both this story and with regard to COVID is that when the facts come in now, and they're unequivocal, they're overwhelming, no one seems to care anymore. Mm-hmm. No, one, no, one, no one will admit they were wrong. Now, as a married guy, I'm well-trained in admitting when I'm wrong, <laughs> I mean, even, even when I don't really think I am. Correct. Um, so I, I truly do not understand when did we stop admitting that when more information comes in, we can go, oh, wait a minute. When? Maybe we rush to judgment, especially when this keeps happening. It's as if Duke lacrosse never happened. It's as if 
Theranos never happened. It's as if Jussie Smollett never happened. Uh, the Covington kids never happened. We're seeing it with Kyle Rittenhouse. It's time and time again, and the media never learns their lesson, mostly because they're never held accountable, Glenn. Well, I think they actually kind of are. I mean, the the blaze, uh, you know, our streaming service and, you know, with YouTube, we beat uh, the CNN ratings many nights, many nights. Uh, it, it is crazy how low their ratings are going. However, right. you're right. They just think that's because we're all stupid. Um, so they don't they're never they're never called into question uh, on what they actually did and what they reported. And you can see that again with the uh, uh, with the White House now and the the Russia hoax. Uh, we know where that came from and we know the media participated in it. Uh, but no, but no one ever gets fired. I no, guess that's no. my point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yes, as institutions, they are suffering in the ratings. I think that a large part of that is because of lack of trust. I mean, there's this narrative going that, that everyone's t- turning off television news in comparison to last year because there's no election. Well, that's part of it. But I think what happened with COVID destroyed what was ever left uh, of their credibility in a large portion of the population. But let me, give you a really, let me give you a really good example that, again, is from the Penn State case, but I think you guys are going to enjoy this because this shows – this relates in, in, many, in some weird ways to COVID. The Dr. Fauci of this case – was a woman by the name of Sarah Ganim, all right? Now, you, you guys fit on this narrative and tell me how absurd this is, all right? So we were told 10 years ago that the woman who broke this case was a 24-year-old Penn State graduate by the name of Sarah Ganim, 24 years old. I don't know about you guys, but when I was 24, I didn't know crap about crap. I mean, I, mean, I, I, can't, I can't even – I was a television sportscaster, an NBC affiliate in Ohio and West Virginia. I can't in retrospect believe they even let me on the air at 24. Uh, I agree. Right? I, I'm the same way. All right, so, so she's 24 years old, and immediately the media says, we found our expert, our, our Dr. Fauci. Tell us what happened in this story, Sarah. So she leads everybody in this panic down this path that turns out to be completely absurd. Now let's follow her narrative from there. She wins the Pulitzer Prize because the media loves this narrative. You know, a semi-attractive mm-hmm. Penn State graduate female brings down the entire Penn State football program. Oh, my God, they're salivating over this. She never writes a book about the case, which is impossible as a Pulitzer Prize winner. It's impossible, but there's a reason why she didn't write a book, because she can't, not because she's just a bad writer, but because her narrative would get her in big trouble about what really actually happened. But she, she gets a great gig at CNN. So she goes from a tiny little paper in, in central Pennsylvania to CNN, where she does nothing. Nothing. The only thing she gets known for are having snowballs thrown at her in a snowstorm she's covering and giggling on set with Wolf Blitzer while covering a horrendous abuse case. So then she she gets, I, I believe, let go by CNN. She doesn't just suddenly retire at the age of, of 30. She, and uh, We never hear from her again. She's an assistant professor in Florida. Now on the 10th anniversary, she comes back to do a podcast about the Sandusky case. She is claiming in her podcast that she has a new Sandusky victim who died of an overdose in 2018 because of their trauma of the Sandusky abuse. Did this person ever claim to be a Sandusky accuser when they were alive? No. They were not a trial accuser. They were not a settlement accuser. I have all the settlement documents. Their family was a huge Sandusky supporter. They died of an overdose in 2018. By the way, Sandusky's in prison. I doubt there was any abuse going on at that time. And then after, after this guy's death in 2018, a year later, there are numerous articles about his overdose because the family is trying to you know, get media coverage for his cause. A year later, still no mention of Jerry Sandusky by the parents. Then all of a sudden, just before the statute of limitations comes in, they get the most unscrupulous lawyer in this case, and they sue Penn State for a lot of money with zero record of this guy ever claiming to be a Sandusky accuser. And then the media reports on Sarah Ganim's podcast that these are, this is a Sandusky victim. You can be a okay. Sandusky victim right. okay. Okay. John, John, without, John, John. Ever, without ever even claiming it. John. And here's Sarah Ganim, who's still the Dr. Fauci of this case. I'm the Rand Paul to, to Sarah Ganim. Unfortunately, I'm not a U.S. senator, so no one's paying attention to me. But this woman should be – this woman's credibility should be completely destroyed. And this is someone the news media put on the pedestal as a heroine. She's a fraud, and it's happening constantly in this media environment. 
But again, we're not going to talk about the Sandusky thing. Uh, <laughs> you are the only person I know that can wind yourself up. <laughs> I mean, you just like, hey, John. Hey, John, how you doing? I'm doing. I'm, I, you're like, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. But let me tell you about the Sandusky thing. And then and by the end, you're like foaming at the mouth. And all I said was, what's going on? <laughs> but isn't that an amazing story? I mean, it, it is. I it mean, is. I, I'm and a it, big believer. And it is, if it, you wait, wait long enough, the truth will come out. It's just many people stop paying attention. Well, and you're exactly right where we started, which is this is what's happening right now to the New York Times reporter that uh, wrote everything about the Russia hoax. It's all false now, provenly false. She's not returning the, the Pulitzer Prize. New York Times is not firing her. They right. just move on. Uh, and, and that is the problem with the media. Let me let me take a quick break and then I'm going to come back because I want to go through some of these um, things that you wrote about uh, in in a panic. Question everything. Once a narrative is set, look out. And the modern media is really like the movie business. John, I've got only a few minutes left and uh, I want to talk to you about something else. So I, uh, let's go through these quickly if we can, because I think these are really important to keep on your refrigerator as you see a big story come by, because it you are exactly right. Um, let's pick it up here. The modern media is really like the movie business. Nonfiction movies used to say, based on a true story. But today you say it's different. Yeah, it's basically, the, the dramatic license is so dr incredible that it's basically stuff that could have theoretically happened, probably didn't, but boy, it makes a great story. And, you know, I think we see this all the time. Yes, we absolutely saw it with the Penn State scandal. Let me give you an example that you, know, you and I are going to slightly disagree on, but not much, on the Russian story. I agree with you. The media blew it on the Russian story. I think there was a kernel of truth there. But they decided, you know what, that's not good enough. We need to juice this. We need to make this into a movie where we've got a Manchurian candidate president, which was always a ridiculous concept to begin with. And, and the, the whole notion of Russian collusion with regard to the, the 2016 election. And so we now know that that movie was false. Uh, but that's why they, but, but they did that for two reasons. One, it fit their political agenda. But two, because let's face it, real life is actually pretty boring. And because the business model of the news media is broken, they need to juice real stories into movie fiction yeah. in order to keep an audience. That is the essence of what has happened here. In the olden days, back in, when you and I were young, there, a, a newspaper was a license to print money, a radio station was a license to print money, there were only four or five TV stations, it wasn't cable news, and so they didn't need to do this because they were going to make money regardless. Now they're, they're desperately scrapping for every little ratings point they can get, and that's why they're juicing stories right. that, that were, were used to be considered nonfiction are now being pretended to be, uh, uh, you know, that they're, be, pretending that they're real when they're not. Quickly, um, the third rail topics. The defense is inherently disadvantaged. This one I think is really true, really powerful. Yeah, when you're dealing with a very controversial topic, whether it's race, whether it is sexual assault, uh, whether it is basically has anything to do with republicanism, <laughs> uh, you know, when uh, the, I, I believe that what the news media fails to understand, or maybe they don't care, is that they have a massive impact on how a story is going to turn out and how they cover it, and it goes way beyond just polluting the jury pool. It goes into the dynamics of putting on a defense, and part of that is people who are prone to jumping in and saying, wait a minute, we're rushing to a, a, a conclusion here, we're rushing to judgment, are afraid to do so because they don't want to be seen as pro-child abuse or pro-racism or, or pro-killing innocent people or whatever it is. And then by the time the facts come in, it's too late because everyone has moved on. And oftentimes the judicial system has already decided we're getting everything in the in bass Ackwards order, we used to wait till a trial. Even here in Los Angeles, we waited till after the trial to have the Rodney King riots. Now we do the riots first and the trial later, and it doesn't work. Invo emotional investment causes one side reporting. This is really hard because this is why they don't correct themselves, is because they're emotionally invested. It's not just about not admitting you're wrong. That's a big part of it. But they so desperately, and let's be clear, liberals control the narrative almost all the time in these situations. Once they get emotionally invested, you can't let go. The world, real world example of this, masks. The, the security blanket of masks. 
and and the anti-Trump virtue signal of masks. They have fallen in love with masks. So the idea that being told that they wore masks for no reason for a year and a half, it's impossible for them to even comprehend that. It is far easier to dupe someone, especially a liberal in the news media, than to convince them that they have been duped. And this impacts all sorts of stories. You um, you have many more, uh, and we'll uh, tweet the story out after 10 years of investigating the Penn State scandal. Here's what the case taught me about the modern media uh, by John Ziegler. Um, I, I, one of the one of them that are in here that I think is just so great is the modern media would have backed the Salem witch trials. It's absolutely uh-huh. true. A hundred percent. As long as they were getting good ratings and and they you know they didn't like the witches. I mean that they absolutely would have they absolutely would have backed the the Salem witch trials. And and Glenn and thank you so much for for caring about this story. And I, I do pe- hope people will at least take a listen to our podcast with the benefit of hindsight because you will not regret it. It's an incredible ride. It teaches you everything you need to know about modern humanity, modern media, and why things are so broken. Where can you get the podcast? Just anywhere. I, iTunes, Spotify, okay. All uh, right. everywhere. Uh, with the benefit of hindsight uh, is the uh, podcast. And one of the hosts is John Ziegler. John, as always, uh, thank you so much. And I know, you, uh, I, I know you're quite opinionated on COVID and what is going on in COVID. You are really going to like my special next week. Uh, and I would, uh, I, 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 if you will keep it to yourself, I'll send you the... Uh, the almost finalized locked in script uh, well i saw i saw that i saw the title and i actually emailed Stu because i've been pitching a documentary that has almost the exact same title really <laughs> <laughs> my title was was panic politics and propaganda and when i saw yours i'm like holy cow yeah. great minds really do think alike. yeah <laughs> well next week is a two-hour commercial free special that i think you're going to uh you're going to feast on because I think there's a lot of stuff in there that even you are going to find uh, new and horrifying and will want to report on it. John Ziegler, we'll talk to you again. Thank you so much. John Ziegler, Zig, Zygmunt Freud is his Twitter handle, Zygmunt Freud.